What would a black hole do if it was inside Uranus? What do I think about AI-generated content impersonating the universe today? What telescope should you buy in 2025? In our free extended version, The Deepest Rabbit Hole I Went Into. All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are, across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Sean E, is there some way we can know for sure if there's a black hole at the center of Uranus? In theory, right, if you had a black hole fall into Uranus, then it would pass right through and just go at the other side of Uranus. But you know, if there was some kind of like three body interaction where the black hole and Uranus and then some other object were interacting with each other, then it could cause the black hole to fall down into Uranus and then remain there. And then like, what would happen? Well, you know, depends on the size of the black hole, like obviously is a black hole the size, you know, produced by a star exploding, then the black hole is going to be much bigger than Uranus. And so it doesn't really make sense to have a black hole inside Uranus. But if the black hole will say a primordial black hole, like a black hole that's been around since the very beginning of the universe formed through regions of higher and lower density at the beginning of the universe, then we could have these primordial black holes of any size, and ones that could absolutely fit inside Uranus. So imagine that you had this very small black hole, maybe something with, you know, the mass of a mountain or a house or something like that. And it falls into Uranus, and through some kind of three body interaction, then it sits around inside Uranus and starts to gobble up material inside Uranus. Well, it's going to get this little accretion disk around it where it's pulling in material. And it's going to probably emit gamma radiation from the accretion disk to produce heat. And so while it is consuming the inside out of Uranus, it's also going to be releasing heat. And so we would see an excess amount of heat coming from Uranus that would indicate that there is a black hole inside Uranus. And so that's how we would know. Ash Star, if you could send one realization back to scientists 100 years ago, what would you send? So 100 years ago, so that'd be like 1925. So what do we know that scientists back in 1925 didn't know? The problem is that they had done a lot of the the broad strokes by that point. Um, they had figured out quantum mechanics, they had figured out relativity, um, they figured out a lot of particle physics. Uh, they were starting to work out some of those larger cosmology. I mean, Hubble around that time did his observations to help them figure out that they were in an expanding universe, but but they were going to figure it out right away. Dark matter was discovered fairly recently after that. And then you know, you had a lot of refinements to those major theories over the next decades. But when you think about the thing, like one thing that's been the most practical is the semiconductor. And so I think if I could go back 100 years and give some piece of information to scientists at the time, it would be the recipe to build semiconductors, that they could skip vacuum tubes, they could skip um, transistors and go straight to integrated circuits. I think that that's what I would probably do. And then all the other stuff would naturally come from that. But that's only 40 years early from when we actually figured out the semiconductor. DVIDs. Do you have any recommendations for a good starter telescope? My budget is around $500 and I will be using it mainly with my eight year old godchild. Do I ever? Um, so there is a revolution in telescopes today. And these are the new automated telescopes. And a couple of years ago, we had this sort of these first round that came out, there was this company called Unicellar, and this other company called Veonis, and they produce these telescopes, which are just like magic. Um, you take the telescope, you put it down, you connect it up with your phone, it looks around the sky, figures out where it is, knows where it is on Earth, knows what time it is, and then tracks things perfectly. And then you say, you know, take a picture of the Orion Nebula, and then the thing goes, finds the Orion Nebula, takes a picture, absolutely incredible. But these things are expensive. I mean, they are many 1000s of dollars. But in the last couple of years, there's been two of these kinds of smart telescopes that have come out that are really affordable and really good. So one is called the Sea Star S50. And it's about $500. Maybe it's a little more but but roughly $500. And then the other one is called the Dwarf three. 
and both are small. Like they look like a size of a, of a hardcover book with a lens on them. And then they'll same thing. You put it outside, you connect your smartphone, the thing will turn, figure out where it is, start taking pictures. And if you do a search on, you know, social media for pictures taken with the sea star or the dwarf, they're really good. And I think that will provide a ton of enjoyment and it's super easy to use. You don't have to, you know, spend your whole night polar aligning your telescope, uh, figuring out how to be able to look through, through your finder scope to find the object that you want. It's incredible. The downside is they're really bad for planets and the moon. And so if you want to take pictures of nebula and galaxies and star clusters and comets and all that good stuff, they're the way to go. But if you want to see the moon and uh, the planets, then you're going to need a different kind of telescope. And the one that I always recommend, say with me, everybody, is the Dobsonian. But you don't need a very big one if, if what you want to do is look at the, the moon and planets. So Celestron, I'm sure they still do. They make something called a first scope, um, which is like a hundred dollar telescope. It's a three inch Newtonian reflector, very small, but lets you see the rings of Saturn and the bands across the planet on Jupiter and the craters on the moon. But it's the old school. You got to line it up. You got to look, you know, down to make sure you've got it lined up and, and Jupiter is moving through the field of view and you got to move it around a little bit. So I think for most people, if you want to kind of get into astrophotography and start taking pictures of comets and galaxies and all that, I recommend both the sea star and the and the dwarf three. Ava, there's a fake channel impersonating you on YouTube. I've had a couple of people mention to me that there are various fake channels on YouTube that are impersonating me. And like, I don't care. <laughs> Right? So keep this in mind. Um, we release everything that we do as a Creative Commons 4.0 license. And what that means is that anyone who wants is free to use our content for any purpose whatsoever. They can write a book and and republish all of Universe Today's articles as their as their book and make all the money. They can create a new channel and republish all of our videos on that channel and make all the money. I don't care. It's fine. Um, you know, I'm the source of the news. So I hopefully people will come back to us. And in this case, because the name of their channel is universe today, something something. Uh, yeah, they're impersonating us. That's kind of frustrating. But I, I, I don't really care. Um, you know, this you can't last very long being a parasite. Um, it's not a sustainable business model. And so, uh, you know, people always tell me like, oh, someone's copied your articles or what? I, I just don't care. I don't care. I'm still here. We're still going. And I can focus on things that are a better use of my time. Now, if you've missed the full live stream, but you still want to watch it, we put a link to the live stream over on Patreon. When I post the new question show, the extended one with the extra question, I also will put a link to this week's full unedited live stream. And so if you're following us on Patreon, you don't have to subscribe, you don't have to pay any money. But if you follow us, then you'll get a notification and then there'll be a link there and you can click that and you can watch the whole question show after the fact. Now, thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers, Simba, Herbert Watkins, Lev Bronstein, Johnny McGill, Johnny Yu, Bakape. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. BBB Nui. On a theoretical spinning space habitat out in space, if you let go of a ball in the air, would it float with microgravity or would it fall back towards the person standing on the spinning habitat? It would be even weirder than that. So, you know, we talk about this idea of how being in weightlessness is bad for the human body, that your bones will lose mass, your muscle lose mass. There are other health complications. And the way you fight against this is you have to exercise, like you have to do weights and you have to run and try to keep your health up. But if you could have a space station that is rotating, and I forget the exact I should get this into my head. But if you are on a space station that is like a couple of 100 meters across, and it's turning two times a minute or something like that, then it will be creating a centripetal pseudo force pushing outward, that makes it feel like you are being on Earth gravity. So you will be sort of stuck to the outside of the station. And then you can walk around and you can pour liquids, and it will feel like you are on solid ground. But not exactly. 
And that's because the amount of gravity that you will experience depends on your distance from the floor. And so you could sort of imagine, like if you went to the very middle of this giant rotating space station, then you're just going to be turning in place. And so you're not going to be experiencing any of this artificial gravity. But then as you get closer and closer to the ground, of the station, then you'll be experiencing more and more gravity until eventually you feel one G when you're standing on the station. And so you will actually feel a different amount of gravity on your head than you feel on your feet. Uh, because you know, it's only a few hundred meters across. And so you'll feel a couple of percent difference from your head to your feet that you will experience like if you try to pour liquids in this rotating station, they will pour at a bit of an angle. And this is called the Coriolis force Coriolis effect. We have this here on Earth, you know, helps cause the some the storms that we have on the planet, but you'll experience these Coriolis forces in the space station. And so if you threw a ball, right, you would throw the ball, and its motion would depend on its altitude above the floor of the station. And so you could literally throw this ball across the station to somebody else. And so it would be moving up and they would be experiencing different amounts of gravity. And then it would also be sort of following the rotation that it had. And so it would be a very complicated thing. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Like you would adapt to it where you'd get good at being able to play catch with a friend and account for the Coriolis forces while you're throwing the ball back and forth. But until the space station just gets so big, that you can't feel that difference, you will always be aware. Uh, if you're walking, you know, sideways, it'll feel different than if you're walking in the direction that the space station is turning, it'll feel different. If you're walking in the opposite direction, it'll be a very surreal experience, but it will provide that artificial gravity that will help you maintain the condition of the human body in these kinds of conditions. Space cat, is the consensus still that Betelgeuse will go supernova in our lifetime? That is not the consensus. The consensus is that we have no idea when Betelgeuse is going to explode. Some point within the next million years or so, Betelgeuse will explode. Now, it is 640 light years away from us, and there's a 1 in 4,000 chance that it has already exploded, and we're just waiting for the light to reach us. But no, no, there is a incredibly remote chance that Betelgeuse is actually going to explode in our lifetime. There's one really interesting piece of evidence that people have found, which is that there appears to be some kind of evidence that Betelgeuse at its core has switched the kind of fusion that's going on. So when you think about it, like the sun, right? The sun is fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. And then when it runs out of usable hydrogen, it's going to start fusing helium into other elements in its core, oxygen, and eventually it'll reach carbon. And then it can't fuse carbon into anything. It doesn't have enough gravity and heat. And so it'll just stop there. And you'll end up with this diamond, right? When the when it blows off its outer layers, you're left with a white dwarf. The white dwarf will cool down and it will be this carbon diamond in space. Betelgeuse has more mass. Um, 18 times the mass of the sun. And so it will be able to keep going. And so it will be able to fuse carbon into and I forget exactly what it does, but it will go all the way up to iron. And then when it reaches iron, it will no longer be able to generate heat from its core it, to counteract the pressure of, of the gravity. And so all of those layers will collapse in and the thing will detonate as a supernova. But right before it tries to fuse iron, there's other elements that lead up to that. And so some astronomers have proposed that they've seen signs um, in the behavior of Betelgeuse that could indicate that it is burning through the kinds of fuels that are just before the end. And then that would mean that in fact, we're just a couple hundred years away from or even a couple of months away, but um, from it actually exploding, but that is not the scientific consensus. And so no, the thing you can count on is that you will be long dead before Betelgeuse actually explodes. But if it did, it would be incredible. Danielle, you always say if a question pops in my mind, write it down, gather them up. Where do we submit them so that you can gather them up? You can put them into the YouTube comments and just on any video and but like your chances of me gathering those up are pretty low. You can join the live show and then your chances are pr are pretty good that I will answer them. What are we at now? I've answered probably 40 questions so far out of out of 
140. So I'm you know, one for three. But the absolute best guaranteed way to get your question answered is to become a patron. So once a month, on the 15th of the month, I put out the call for the patron questions. And then we get a bunch of questions from the patrons. Some of you are watching right now and you've been through this experience. And then me and my producer Anton, we will answer the questions. I get a chance to do some research in advance. So I've got better answers. Um, and then the show lasts for like three or four hours long and we get to every single question. So if you if what matters is that you get the question answered, join the patron. And then I will answer the question. I guarantee it. And you meet me. I also send you an invitation to have a, um, a personal interview with me. So, uh, you know, more reasons to join the Patreon. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? And this week's bonus story is all about rabbit holes. How deep have I gone? And I'll put a link in the show notes to that episode. All right, those are all the questions that we had in this episode. Thank you, everyone who asked questions in the YouTube comments and everybody who showed up for the two hour live stream that we record. Now we do this every week, there should be an announcement somewhere here on the channel for when the next one is going to be so subscribe, click on the notifications bell, and then you'll get an announcement when the show is about to go live, right? You can trust YouTube, right? Right? All right, I'm going to give you another thing from the shelf. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bear Lake Roofing, Brian Body, Caredwin, Chuck Hawkins, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hans Schultz, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Lawrence Federico, Michael Purcell, Paul Roebuck, Ren Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, SpiderSub.io, Stephen Fowler Melny, Thomas L. Skadron, Vlad Shiblin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So it's time for another episode of What's on the Shelf. And so this week, it is a book called The Creatures of Bar Save, which is an Earth Dawn source book. Now, for those of you who don't know what Earth Dawn is, it was FASA, the company that makes Shadowrun and Battletech. This was their answer to Dungeons and Dragons. It is a fantasy world, but it's essentially Shadowrun. So if you're familiar with Shadowrun, you know, which is like a cyberpunk magic game uh, and video game and so on, then Earth Dawn was their fantasy version of it. And I don't think it went very far and didn't last very long. But um, I wrote the monster manual for Earth Dawn. And so uh, yeah, and the book is about essentially a dwarven scholar is uh, goes to talk to a really powerful dragon that remembers how things were like before the cataclysm. And so the dragon is happy to talk, but also doesn't remember things very well about how things were. So he's an unreliable uh, narrator. And yet also you get all the stats and information. So anyway, that's like my old life. I wrote this 25 years ago. Um, 35 years ago? I'm so old. Yes, 35 years ago. So there you go. That's on the shelf behind me. More game books that I wrote also behind me. All right. We'll see you next time.